Hi, everybody. I'm Christy Kate, and I'm here today with Mela Lee. She's going to talk to us about her voiceover career. You might have known her from uh, Mortal Kombat, You've Been Jade, Apex Legends, as Lifeline, and a bunch of other stuff. How are you doing today? Pretty glad to be here. How are you doing? Good, thanks. So as far as voiceover goes, what kind of got you into voiceover? Were you always a driven actress? Is that something that you always wanted to do, or did you kind of fall into it? Or Well, I, I some... Somebody uh, said I should get into voiceover, and I've always been told I had a good voice. And I think everybody's, you know, that's when people come up to me, want to get into voice. They're like, I've been told I have a good voice, so I, I didn't take it <laughs> to relate. heart. But I, um, I took a class. It was like a sampler class. Okay. And um, every weekend we would go through the different forms of voiceover. So um, one weekend animation, next weekend commercials. You know, next weekend, audiobook and narration, where I got my start. Oh, wow. And then last weekend was um, an agent, oh, agency-like wow. uh, showcase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't guarantee Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you're not going to get might. picked up. But, the, you know, the five-year-old in me was like, it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did. I, I got discovered, and I got an agent, and um, booked a national commercial right away. Wow. And But um, still was, like, in school, was... Um, I'm kind of a math geek and got into being, um, I was working on Wall Street and, and doing, being a math analyst. And when you say school, was this like college? College, okay. yeah. yeah nice. And um, so I kind of waited. I mean, I got discovered, but I, I didn't just jump into voiceover. I felt, overnight, yeah. Yeah, I think I, in, at the time I thought it was like being a professional dodgeball player. Mm. Like that's not a thing. <laughs> Who makes a living as a voice actress? Is that real? But yeah. of course, like. Because you don't really see voice no. actresses normally. It's kind no. of always behind the camera and you don't think about it. Like it's always so funny when you talk to kids and like you're talking to them about their favorite show and then they find out that there's a human behind the voice. They yeah. just don't get it. Yeah, there was a, a girl um, that was literally watching one of my shows in an airplane and she's maybe five four and I just did the voice and she kind of freaked out <laughs> <laughs> she was like what's happening and I was like oh okay mm, I'm gonna be quiet I didn't want to like destroy her world <laughs> I was like that didn't go well well hey who knows though maybe you've inspired her to be a voice actress <laughs> down the road it's planting the seed <laughs> that's really fun so you started doing math what was the idea to do voiceover was it something that you've always loved like video games, animation, or was it like you just saw like a poster for the class and it just inspired you to go or? Um, I was actually working for um, a private investment firm and uh, they were uh, unraveling. So oh. I had a severance and had some time before I was going to go to my next job for about eight weeks while they were just folding up, which happens a lot in investment banking. It's not like going out of business. It's like they invest and then they're like, well, they're like we're, we're done. Yeah. yeah. So um, I took the class and um, but again, because then my next job came around. Uh -huh. um, and so I did uh, audiobook and narration, um, intro narration, and then some anime, mm -hmm. which is okay. uh, Japanese animation, which helped me because then uh, there was an engineer who, s who said my friend's working on the Gilmore Girls and they need some voice replacement uh, oh, ADR. You know, for yeah. ADR. I didn't know what that was, but I was like, sure, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and I drove onto the Warner Brothers lot, and I was like, oh, my gosh, wouldn't it be crazy if that was my life? Yeah. And, again, people sometimes will ask, you know, what was your most, your biggest challenge in voiceover? And I, I think my best, biggest obstacle was myself. Uh, what so I thought was possible. it wasn't matching lip flaps. It was more so like, wait, this is actually something I can do. Yeah, and, and I, I think, I, I think everybody's like this. You, you're like, you're. Sometimes your own worst enemy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not your best cheerleader. Yeah. And so I was good at it, but I, I wasn't going home going, well, this is amazing. I should do this forever. <laughs> uh, I was like, it was pretty good. I, I totally <laughs> relate to that. It's right? the kind of thing where, you know, you'll have people be like, hey, you were great. And then you'll have a setback and you'll be like, I can't do this, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. It's so totally being your own worst critic is something that is challenging to navigate. How did you kind of get past that? Or do you still struggle with with that? Um, I think every every person who's an artist struggles with imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like, And I think now I deal with it because uh, I, I know I'm really good at what I do. Um, I love what I do. And so what compels me to be a better actress or to be a better technician um, with dialects or, or, or voice um, is that it connects you to literally millions of people around the world mm. and the storytelling element of it and... Um, I get over myself and I look at, it's not about me being the best in the world, it's that I'm here. 
yeah. I have this opportunity and what am I going to do with it? And you're making a connection with people. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I didn't, I, I, each step was um, like winning the lottery. Yeah. I constantly say it's like being Charlie <laughs> in the Chocolate Factory. I don't know if you guys have seen the really good movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that right. That's what, I don't know. Yeah, okay, that's honest. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's this beautiful moment, and I'm a big Raw Doll fan. I love, yeah. I love his books, um, where the contest is over, all of the golden tickets have been found, and Charlie and, and his grandfather get a bar of chocolate just to enjoy the chocolate. Mm. And I think that was me where I was enjoying these jobs as they came, but I didn't think I was going to win the golden ticket. Mm. And then they open it up, and there's this last golden ticket. And the other kids sometimes are at the chocolate factory or the candy factory, and they're like, Meh, okay, it's kind of cool. It's a chocolate river. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, a chocolate river? <laughs> this you're is like, amazing. Fine. I'm driving on to Warner Brothers lot, Sony lot, you know, yeah. NBC. And, and just, I, it's so exciting. What was that like hearing that you've been cast in some of these roles? Did you know when you were auditioning that you were like, this is something that I think I can get? Or was it something completely out of the the hat and you were like I had no idea I would book this this is amazing or did you kind of think like I I can vibe with this character I might get this um I think there's characters that that I definitely vibe with um when I'm auditioning voiceover is a little different than on camera especially in in video games mm. um and some of the animated projects they have uh, a code name uh-huh. And, and they the characters are code names. So for Mortal Kombat, you know, our job basically is to audition a lot, yes. a lot. And um, you, you relate to the character. You, and so, you know, maybe you, you audition 10 or 20 times in a day, recording in your booth and relating. And um, it makes you a better artist. I think it's kind of like painting. You're not painting every canvas to be like, oh, my God, it's going to be a million dollars. You're just enjoying <laughs> the process, it for right? Fun, yeah. But uh, I was in a, a closet because my studio was being finished. And so I did a quick audition for Guard A. Okay. Wow. Guard A. That's very and generic. Yeah, sounding. right? So I feel like they normally even try to name the fake characters. Yeah, like so it's Guard A. Yeah. And one of the lines was, You seem confident. Now you seem overconfident. And she was being basically saying, I wouldn't step closer. And yeah. and then, you know, there was the other 19 auditions that day. And so when I got Guard A, and I knew it was a Warner Brothers project, and I was really excited because it's a AAA game of oh, some kind. It's huge. Yeah. I'm a guard. Yeah. Uh, and then they were like, well, once you sign your paperwork, you're I'll Jade you. in yeah. Mortal Kombat. Were you, like, screaming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that was the first role that I, and I love all my roles. I love all, everything that I get. That was the first role where I kind of geeked out a little. Well, Warner Brothers, you know, is a huge company right? and all this and Mortal Kombat. Everybody knows the theme song. Right. And I'm yeah. such a, I'm a tomboy. And yeah. so like, I always talk about my inner eight year old boy. It's never a girl. <laughs> like, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. And that was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, that was, it was amazing working with the NetherRealm team, um, Everybody's so hands-on in the gaming industry, mm. too. So the writers and directors, it's, it's very much an ensemble project. Do you find that it's different recording for video games than, say, other projects? And is how they record it? Like, you know, is it just kind of you and one person in the booth? Or is it, like, a bunch of people behind the screens? Or does it depend on the project? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, it does depend on the project. Mm. Uh, sometimes you are you are recording remotely, so the team is in London oh. um, or they're, you know, in New York or, or Chicago and you don't really see them. Yeah. And um, I think that's when a, pro a project's more established mm -hmm. and so they're bringing you in for the second or the third or the fourth installment maybe. Yeah. Um, with uh, Mortal Kombat and Apex Legends with Respawn, um, the, the developers, the writers, everybody was in the room. Mm -hmm. And so it was really exciting to have uh, you the know, live feedback. Yeah, yeah. Um, the designers, the developers, the writers, the directors. Everybody was in the room, and we were creating it. Um, that's a new experience for me. A lot of times, uh, being an animation actress, you can have live reads with your crew. But in gaming, it's it's like green screen acting. Mm. It's just you. Yeah. And um, many times, because of the top secret nature, you don't see a script or anything. You don't know who your character is until you it walk in the until door. Until you walk in, yeah. And so it's very much it's like a, a cold read. It is, and it's a very much a director's medium. Mm. So that director, you know, draws you into the story, explains your world, um, and and gives you as much as they can. Mm. But that's where it's kind of like uh, we were talking earlier about it's being at recess, yeah. because at that point there's this this magical 
subconscious thing that clicks in mm. and you go into the booth and the world becomes real yeah. and you're in it and you, you see a, a script in front of you on a screen and um, sometimes it'll say, you know, heighten battle or, but that's it. Yeah. And you give two reads and they'll correct you if they want to redirect you and go in a different direction. But there's this crazy beautiful thing that happens between a voice actor and a director once you've synced in it's like you just know and so you'll right. do it and it's like they kind of click and figure out how to direct you because there's so many different directing yeah. styles well and they almost don't say anything once you get going in a game you have like a thousand lines mm. you ha you do them twice and like a b you know um that's because you're truly living the character at that yeah. point you're fighting you're moving you're running and um such a geek i'm into <laughs> neuroplasticity and like how your brain you know, works, and it's been incredible for me. I, I was in a, a car accident four years ago, and I fractured my back. Oh, wow. Several vertebrae. And it's amazing I, that you can still walk and that you're here. And oh, like my gosh, healthy. and I think a lot of it is gaming. Like, here I was mm -hmm. on a walker and a cane, you know, doing physical therapy, but going in and being a goddess and a warrior uh. and running, and, you know, I'm looking at the screen at my character and really envisioning this, this world that was very real to me, and I could feel my expectations of my healing. Mm. And I'm so Cali, you it's guys. Like, it's I like could feel the expectations of my healing <laughs> and the crystals and stuff. And so <laughs> no, it's, like, it's like I got the crystal energy here, you know. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, the brain is a magnificent, like the human body is extraordinary. And um, to know that uh, my work really was a big part of me reaching further and further each time I was getting better. So when you're embodying these characters, how do you kind of come up when you get an audition? What is your process for breaking it down and creating these characters? Because it sounds like a lot of it is what you're talking about with it being neurological and in your brain and kind of living the character. Yeah. Are you more of like an imaginative actress or method or what kind um, of processes does that look like? It's for funny. You? Um, you know, the only thing that doesn't really work is Meisner because you're not reacting off of anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's challenging. Yeah, you're like, oh, this is my. What piece did you of say? <laughs> um, I think there's some of it that's method because I I think at this point, um, especially in voiceover, you are, I mean, there, there's a range of voice that I have, but these are all me. These are aspects of myself. So uh, I think it's not like I'm hiding myself in the character. You, you need to relate to the character, you know, even if it's a villain. Mm. You know, we all think Have we're the hero, but yeah. you're the villain in somebody else's story. So mm -hmm. you look at these characters as yourself, yeah. and you see those, those elements, I think, that are very real to you. Um, but I'm pretty visceral. So for me, where am I? You know, what time of day is it? What's it smell like? Mm. You know, it, it, is it a dry environment? Is she gritty? Yeah. Um, is she just like never had a bad day in her life? Um, you know, there's all these different waves and I'm such a musical person that I think the music of the character uh, is really important to me. Like what would they be listening to? Mm. Um, what is their cadence? Yeah. Um, and those are things that sometimes have to happen in three minutes yeah. before you actually record. Um, but I find that the environment and the imagination of the environment is really, and where how I fit into it mm. is, is pretty it's powerful. It's nice when they give you relationships with the other characters that you're acting with in the scene. Because yes. you're like, well, who is this person? Like, do I like them? Do I hate them? You mm -hmm. know, making those choices. And they do oftentimes when you're doing series reads, when they're they're casting for a series, they'll give you the breakdowns of all of the characters so that you know who you're talking to. Yeah. And... Um, that's a new thing for me. I'm, you know, getting better in my career, getting more <laughs> opportunities. Um, but it's been exciting to see initial, you know, can't tell you what they're for, yeah. um, but the initial drawings, the initial ideas. And um, I'm doing a show right now for Amazon, and um, I guess we can kind of talk about it. Um, Kristen Bell's an executive producer. Oh, wow. Jackie Tone's a uh, creator and, and also acting in it. And just amazing, incredible people. But to see the beginning of the characters and the initial two-dimensional drawings and then the animatics and, you know, we're getting to see these characters come to life. And yeah. it's, it's, it's like a second childhood. Like, I'll get all teary. Like, hey, I didn't do so good the first childhood, <laughs> but this one is amazing. <laughs> I'll take it. Do you I find when it. you go in to record those that the characters are slowly evolving and changing? Or was it always kind of there from the beginning or have they redirected the character in a sense? Because um, you're saying that animatics have changed or? 
Yeah, the voice stays about the same. Okay. Um, they're really th- uh, Amazon and Gamont on on the project I'm working on now. Um, very hands on. Mm, that's nice. Really, just an incredible executive production crew, and and everyone's there, and and I think they're taking great care mm. because the intention of the series is so beautiful. Oh. I can't talk about it. But I was I'm so say, excited. I'm like, I want to be like, oh, I want to ask you more it's questions about this. But liquid I know I can't. elixir of pure joy. <laughs> like I get to do animation for a living, and yeah. there's so much love and wonder and imagination, and you know. The, the actual process is amazing, mm. but knowing the joy that it, it could possibly give to others is just huge. That's the golden ticket. What has been, like, your best, like, fan experience that you've had? Can you think of something where it was very profound? I know you mentioned the plane story, but that was really cute. But I know that, especially you've been in a lot of anime, like, it seems, and video games, from what I've been told, it seems like a lot of those fans are very much into those characters for helping in some cases, like, save their life, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, there's several, but, like, one of my f- first major conventions um, was, uh, like, Comic-Cons in Australia, and I was with Bill Farmer, who's Aww. the voice of Goofy. Goofy. And um, I, I was sitting next to him. He was so gracious. Mm-hmm. And there was um, a young man who said, my mother's in the hospital, mm-hmm. and would you... Um, singer like happy birthday uh, and then Bill was very gracious he's like well I'm not a singer so he did a message from Goofy and had me sing to him Aww. and um, that whole experience was pretty amazing the person who put it on was having a heart transplant oh wow and his daughter missed me so he actually brought me to another convention a few months later in Adelaide uh, Australia, so that she could see me, and I got to meet him, and it was that alone. I was thinking that's pretty wonderful. What a great father! Yeah. And obviously, the heart transplant went well, and he's he's still alive. It's like nine years later, and he's doing great. And um, in comes this line, and this person says, "I don't know if you remember me. We met in Melbourne, Aww. and you and and Bill wished my mother happy birthday in the hospital. And I was I was getting all teary-eyed just at that. And he said, she passed away that week. Mm. But you made her feel so special oh. that her childhood hero had said hello. And, and I was able to, you know, text Bill. Um, yeah. And we were talking so that he could send a message. And it was so overwhelming, his graciousness. But to, but to be a part of something that would be a family memory that was that powerful the responsibility starts to kick in because yeah. I've just been excited to be here. But when you understand that we have an art form that can elevate people in, in dire circumstance, you know, or just daily circumstance, yeah, it's really wonderful and powerful. And, and I come from a, a family of doctors and lawyers and scientists. So I felt like I'm not curing cancer. What's, what's acting. Yeah. But that's the first time I really thought, well, that's, that's what we do. Yeah. That's the possibility. Well, and I think it's also, too, like, you're a voice actress, but you're also, you have, like, such, like, a diversity kind of uh, change in the industry, in a sense. I don't really know how to word this correctly, but it's, it's definitely it's, it's rapidly it's developing. Yeah, it's like, you're not just, like, a standard whatever kind of doing everything. Like, you can, like, have a voice for people that might not have had a voice yes. before and have a perspective that people might not have seen. And so... How, what has that been like? Have you noticed a change over the years, like as yeah. things have shifted? Yeah. I'm grateful in the voiceover industry as a woman to have grown up and been allowed to be a time traveler, to be a, a six-year-old girl and, you know, like the wonder and 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 be different races, different colors of skin, pink, blue, purple, all of that. Um, I think that Hollywood and and the film and television industry, but especially the gaming industry, are uniquely poised to, um, for the last two decades, have raised a generation of people worldwide that expect to work beside people of different cultures, Mm. different colors, different shapes, different sizes. And, you know, even in Lord of the Rings, you're you're finding that the smallest person was the greatest. And so we're finding um, this these unique qualities in each of us. Yeah. And I think it's teaching us worldwide that it's not always what you think it is. Yeah. We are breaking down stereotypes, um, recreating our a concept of what's possible, mm-hmm. a 
across cultural and, and racial lines. Um, that being said, in the last probably two or three years, I've seen, um, and I'm, I'm for all diversity, cultural yeah. diversity of all kinds, but for me personally to, to see the writing and the richness and the depth of characters for people of color yeah. has been magnificent and inspiring. You know, when I was younger, there was maybe Mariah Carey and, you know, like three people that look like you. And yeah. um, now there's just this breadth and depth of diversity yeah. um, of culture. And it's beautiful not only to watch, but also to participate in. Yeah. Um, do you I, get to share like your own personal experiences with the writers or? Sometimes we do. Yeah. Definitely. Um, uh, like I got the opportunity to be in uh, Marvel Avengers Assemble. And I played Princess Xanda, Black Panther's nemesis. Mm. Uh, he has so many. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, what was beautiful about it is Princess Xanda in the 70s um, was kind of a camp character. Mm. And the writers brought her back and her superpower now, instead of just being a, a vengeful woman, was shape-shifting. And so she spent most of the series, she would be, uh, she was Captain America, nobody knew. She was Black Widow, then she became Iron Man. So it meant that wow. she had all of those superpowers in her. That's amazing. But was ignored, marginalized, and set aside. So she became a villain wow. because the Shadow Council would let her use her gifts and her skills. Yeah. And so now she's not just like, I think they even in the 70s in the comic, she was at the KCF. You know, it, like in a drive through window, it, it was very like yeah. hiding out, trying to be, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I'm super grateful for the character, but <laughs> now they address the fact that this was this powerful, beautiful woman. And she has this scene where she's fighting Black Panther and she says, you know, they wanted me to be pretty. I am just a great warrior. I'm as great a warrior as you, Black Panther. And she just like, you can see the anger. Like she never, they said, be pretty, be a princess. Mm. I'm more than pretty. And you saw, like, uh, I get chills thinking about the writers giving her this depth of, yeah. I could have been so much more. And, and that story of what happens to a marginalized person or people group yeah. that has all of this power to change, to be heroes, but they're not given that opportunity. Well, we it's, it's amazing, too, how Black Panther in and of itself broke all these box office expectations and was just kind of like, of course, people want to see this. Right. Well, it's I think original. It, it's fresh. It's something that people need to see. Well, I think it, it redefined who we thought the villains were because it wasn't just, you know, uh, you know, black against white or it was it wasn't yeah. it wasn't cut and dry. No, we could see the humanity in, in our heroes, which is what you've seen in 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 all of the comic universes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's why there's this boom right now. Um, in in exploring, I have a friend, Derek Robertson, um, uh, and he is doing the boys. Like he had started the boys, which is like this hardcore, like we are heroes. Like who are your heroes? But I think people are looking at it because we all feel like a hero ten percent of the time. Yeah, but pretty human the other ninety percent. Well, and that's kind of what you were talking about with villains earlier. Is villain villains themselves aren't truly villains. Like, when you're, when you're talking about your character, it sounds like she just has an expectation for society to want to accept her. Accept her. And that's not, that's not a villainous thing. Right. You know, maybe you know, the what, way she Who would she, she be if she it? had a greater opportunity? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think that's what you're addressing is, like, have you seen a change? And the opportunities for diversity, um, not only to be portrayed, but for to have uh, trans actors and binary characters, like in Apex Legends, and um, having people of that culture give that story authenticity. Yeah. Um, and then for me, I just met my biological father three oh, years wow. ago. And and to have that family, um, you know, of, of Islander and Creole, Ethiopian and Welsh, um, to see all of this, this lucky breadth of characters I get to play, but it also... It reflects my heritage. Well, it probably and informs you too. You get to learn oh about their yeah. customs and everything that they kind of and have experienced. To see in the life. pride that, that my father has, and you know, Lifeline from Apex Legends looks just like my nana. Aww. <laughs> and she's so proud that she thinks everyone is cosplaying and dressing up as her. <laughs> <laughs> there I mean, maybe this, they are. <laughs> there's this great uh, cosplayer, K Bear, and she did this great Lifeline uh, cosplay. But I didn't know she had other 
less clothed versions of it. Oh, so I was funny. like, she's like, show me the cosplay, you know? <laughs> and she's 91, so this is all oh, new to wow. her. And so I, I touched a screen and you know how sometimes it's just the thumbnail and it yeah. got bigger and it was like, sexy yeah <laughs> it was and and then for just a second she looks at it and I'm like oh my gosh that is so sorry she's like no I think I looked that good back in that day <laughs> she's yeah. like it's a fair representation that's was like, great <laughs> well and it's not you know sexualizing women it, you know it's supporting them for being who they want to be oh and what she's they a beautiful wear. woman and did not yeah. mind being portrayed as beautiful but it's been a joy to um, as a as a voice actress to really get to embrace um, all of my culture and and um, just have my ancestors all around me and be able to move into this next phase of, of my career as an actress kind of in a wholeness and a and an understanding of who I am and how I can um, contribute to this new storytelling dynamic that we do have here in Hollywood yeah of looking for authenticity and and stories that mean something and that can create connection. Do you have like an idea of what your dream job would be? Like the ultimate of everything? Maybe you've already booked it. I don't know. <laughs> but was there something maybe like when you were younger or even now where you were like, oh, man, I always wanted to be in blah, blah, blah. You know, it's funny. I, I wanted to be um, a marine biologist, a scientist, um, a counselor and a journalist and an actress. Okay. You know, those are the things, you know. When you were a kid, you could be And I was anything. reading a journal recently, and she's like, so that I could use my access to the media, what five-year-old says this, <laughs> to be able to help others overcome adversity and understand how special they are. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, hey, Mella. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> like, let me do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, dream job. I've gotten a taste of it with my Amazon project and with the Marvel projects when nice. you're working in an ensemble. And so my dream job would be on camera or behind the mic to be with an ensemble, um, cast and crew, creating compelling stories. Um, I, I was an only child for a very long time, and uh, now I have like lots of brothers and sisters and cousins. Nice. And, and it's funny that that's, that's my desire was always to be in an ensemble or on a team. Um, and I would love the opportunity to, to long-term be a part of an ensemble uh, and I, in, in very many ways, I'm, I'm at the beginning of that in several of my projects. Nice. But to tell compelling and timely stories um, that, that matter. That's, that's always the dream. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I and feel like you're right. I feel like Hollywood is going in that direction, and I think that more and more projects are doing that, and it's going to continue. Yeah. And it's always it's not necessarily the things that you think. You know, I'm yeah. such a serious person, but like when you're like, well, I just do animation. I, that's <laughs> how I felt. But when you when you're sitting with the creators of Batman and Bill Farmer, and you've got all of these these people around you, and and people are this is a thing. They come to 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 pop culture conventions to meet us and and to share stories of of what how our work has what it's meant to them. And um, I work with. Also, the Fire Foundation here in California oh, that cool. helps fallen firefighters and their families, and um, and these are heroes. Yeah, I was going to say, and especially in California, every oh, year we've had a really yeah. <laughs> the last few years too have been particularly rough uh, throughout California. You know. Yeah, and um, they're an extraordinary crew, and you know when they're like, "Yeah, on my off time, I love playing your game," or I'm like, "Huh." Like I'm 15 minutes of your day. Like I'm yeah. I'm a one percent part of the recipe of a hero. Like yeah. whatever I could do to be a part of, not only uh, being a part of their recreation, but being able to to visit and work with their children. Um, they have these amazing camps for children that have been affected by fires physically. Mm -hmm. And and um, do they have like burns or like is it more so that they lost a family member? It can be all of that. Oh. Um, but working with them and, and opening up a discussion with the Fire Foundation and the California Professional Firefighters of how we in our voiceover community, in the gaming community, can, you know, make appearances and do voiceover workshops for Hello, uh, we're welcome back. We had a little recording snafu, but we are back. We were talking about firefighters, and I know Mella yeah. wanted to kind of mention, I think where we left off before it kind of died was we were talking about these kids in this camp, and like they were had either burns or they lost a family member from fires. Well, they're kids, and that's where we'll leave it. They're beautiful, wonderful kids, and um, Brian K. Rice is uh, the head of the fire 
firefighters, uh, California firefighters and the California Fire Foundation. And he's been really proactive this year um, with, as you know, we've had some intense fires, but he's been really good about not only being a, a fierce advocate for his firefighters, but the communities they serve. And um, I'm just honored to be able to bring some light to what they're doing. The California um, Professional Firefighters and the California Fire Foundation, um, do look it up. There's a fire foundation in every state, um, but here in California, we definitely could use your help, and uh, please look them up. Uh, it's just like CaliforniaFire.org, or do you know? CAFireFoundation.org. There you go. CAFireFoundation.org. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just so proud of of what they do, but um, knowing as voice actors and actors that that we can do something to help those heroes, the real heroes, yeah, um, is magnificent and exciting, and that gets you up every day. And I, I think there's a point in your career where you stop wondering, oh my gosh, I hope I'm good enough. Yeah, you're good enough, but what's the why? Well, Why it's like are you are it? Lifeline in a sense. She's the support character. She brings the support to the people needing aid. And I do like, relate to Lifeline. Yeah, and, and here you are supporting firefighters. Like, that's the same thing. Well, and to be fair, my um, my Nana, who looks just like Lifeline, and we share that culture heritage, my mother um, uh, is English-American, and but she uh, was a medical specialist in the military. Mm. And so, you know, that that love of biology and 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 being able to you know neuroplasticity and and working with uh, prosthetics limbs and 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 bionics that love came from her mm. because she she's a veteran that's and that's what she works in that environment so she she gave me that's like a, a gift that she's given me is a passion for our wounded warriors and our first responders mm. and and what can I do in my life always I you know feel like what can I give back yeah because every day regardless of race religion politics they are there for you you know in the darkest parts of the longest night you yeah. know, that's where our heroes are and and I hope that everybody um finds uh, not just a charity but I prefer it to be my charity <laughs> no, <laughs> no anything but you know our first responders people that help people that are in transition from catastrophic illness or natural disaster or uh, catastrophic injury, victims of violent crimes. Um, these are always things, unfortunately, that will exist and be needed. And I think when you give back to those organizations, you're reminded of Humanity. a bigger purpose. Yeah. It's not just about paychecks and, and Instagram followers. And, you know, we're human beings. Yeah. And every, you know, every day I, I have a, a voicemail message. And it's like, remember, no matter what the day brings, you matter. You mean something, and you can make a difference. Do you listen to that every day? Like when you wake up, is it part of like your routine? <laughs> no, it's my voicemail. It's literally your. I voicemail. don't listen to it ever. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, I feel that way. It's like because I. Cool. I think sometimes we get overwhelmed with the news of the day. Mm, it's true. What What could I do? Yeah. And the answer is, what can you do? Yeah. You know, again, that goes into quantum mechanics and physics. I feel like just the, the smallest drop of love you know, affects the entire world. Well, and there's actually been science to prove that too. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so I, I think we all matter and you do what you can. And if it's just in your family, um, you know, sometimes everybody's trying to help everybody else, but they're not remembering the, the humanity in their own family. And, mm -hmm. you know, Great. that understanding, that connection can be a powerful healing. Well, that's beautiful. I, I kind of want to shift gears a little bit because I know sure. you're talking about the Amazon show. Mm -hmm. And um, now as far as like voiceover recording for that, is, is n it's in a group. Are you doing a lot of like improv? Do you do that a lot? Or is that <laughs> something that like, do you have specific specialties in voiceover that you're like, ooh? Um, I'm okay at improv. I okay. mean, we improvise, but uh, in, a, in a live read, because it's all of us, we have a script. Yeah. And and so we, we don't want to run over each other's lines. So sometimes we'll go back and, and improvise a little bit on, on a pickup. But um, the writers do a really good job. Nice. Um, but in other parts of animation, especially in auditioning, when they want to know, they've given you some words, but they want you to kind of yeah. get going. And I think further on when you get into a script, you know, we're like on episode 30 right now. Yeah. 
And we do. We improvise. A we lot. we add a little words because we know our characters. Yeah, you know what their t- what, like their ticks are. And mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can kind of throw that little flourish in there. Yeah. Um. So animation definitely. There's room for improv. Anime and and ADR looping. It's like no. it's not even not <laughs> even kind of. It's like exactly this time and and gaming as well. Um, you know, there's a graphic animation and and even though you have some freedom and they're they're programming to you, there's a finite amount of time. Yeah. Um, well, especially when games come to be like an hour long or no hours long. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> they're more than an hour long. Excuse me. They're hundreds of hours long. Yeah. You know, depending. We on do improvise a little. They'll be like, "Well, how would you say this?" Uh, and so we do add a little bit of our own lingo. Nice. Um, sometimes in games and. Uh, but it's interesting that I've been such uh, a stickler for like memorizing the lines or doing reading the lines as is. Mm. It's new in animation for me, um, as opposed to music where I can improvise all the time. Mm. You know, that's jazz or or in that pop environment. That's how you write songs, and so there's freedom. Like there's an expectation. Yeah. But because most of my career in voiceover has been, you know, the beginning of it was you know uh, audiobook. Okay. Uh, you, you don't change the words. Do you still do that? I don't actually. It's so time consuming, right? <laughs> no, I thought it was amazing. Oh, I got okay. an award as like best new artist for the oh, Audio wow. Publishers Association. And then I never did it again. <laughs> it was like they assumed I was so busy. <laughs> I was like, okay. No, I've done a couple of um, science and history books where okay. you're reading because now. You understand that too. So I'm oh, sure when and you're I, reading I, the word, you're like, I know. Oh, and I'm passionate about it. <laughs> it's interesting because now, you know, our history books, even 20 years ago, ended at a certain time. So, you know, I finished that part of, I think, my learning before the internet was king. Mm. And so now they'll have a book and then there are modules that they add yeah. monthly to history. Nice. So that if kids are reading about it, they also have the online version and you're like, well, this happened. And so history isn't 20 years ago. It's now. It's now. now. Yeah. Which I think is fascinating. It's true. That is interesting. Because right? history shapes us, but a lot of kids are more so what is happening directly right now is yeah. affecting them. Well, and I think that's important because then you can see what the end of that story was. Mm-hmm. I think we used to think of history as 20 or 30 years ago, but we didn't see the connection. Are we doing the same mm-hmm. things? Did that policy work? Mm-hmm. What happened at the end of that revolution? You know, who's in power now? Um I'm such a nerd. I'm like, those are really interesting things. <laughs> I just put my glasses and be like, it's so interesting. Economic paternalism in third world countries after the colonization feast of the 18th and 19th centuries. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's happening to I was my like, brain. I like traveling and I know <laughs> stuff like that, but I'm like, okay, we this do. kind of stuff, the minutia. I'm like, I don't know. I need to learn my history again. <laughs> well, people ask, like, how much of you is in your characters? You're right. I do play Lifeline or I'll play nerds or scientists, yeah. and I'm absolutely fascinated by that okay. stuff. And there used to be in my brain that there was math mela, music mela, and voiceover mela. Yeah. And those are just so different, And mm. but they're really not. They kind of all work together in the same. Because you're right. Like, voiceover has, like, the melody, the cadence of music, and then sometimes there's, like, the math characters that come yeah. in for that. And I'm sure... In, like, math, you know, there's moments where you have to think of something maybe in voiceover that allows you to... I, yeah, I always explain things in math. Reframe it, maybe, or yeah, something. Yeah, it's not that coefficient doesn't work. Let's plug in something else. Yeah, just like you would with acting. Like, oh, this this choice didn't work. Let right? me try a different choice. Very fluid. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you see the math in a good cast. Like, mm-hmm. it really equals something beyond itself. That and is true. It is like a good show is like good math. Mm-hmm. When it, you add it all together, it just works perfectly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Casting directors are great mathematicians, <laughs> right? Um, Did you have to develop a lot of relationships with casting directors or a lot of the jobs you're getting just from auditions that you've been provided or? Well, I think a lot of on-camera actors and probably voice actors are better at it than I am. I Oh, like networking? I fell into this career and um, was here doing music and I had a publishing deal and doing voiceover and I was just so excited that I was like, oh my gosh, and I have a job and you have free, like, they have craft service. Like, yeah. You know, and who knew that you'd go to a voiceover job and they have coffee and you just feel so <laughs> special. Um, you don't so have to dress up fancy for that either. <laughs> I try. No, well, this you um, are. No, this is on okay. camera. <laughs> but I mean, like, if you're in your, like, booth at home, it's just kind of like, okay. Everybody you know. always says that but we still get dressed up as human beings I, it's true i do yeah. it's funny everyone's like isn't it great you can go to work in pajamas i was like well 
can you? <laughs> I mean, if it's at your house, maybe. But yeah, no, you're true. When I go into an actual session, I'm like, hey. that's the impression I think of voice <laughs> actors is that, you know, but we are in group reads. So yeah. we don't wear pajamas often. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just, I was so fascinated and so excited to be here that I wasn't angling I wasn't not that people that are networking are angling I wasn't necessarily business savvy mm. so I wasn't keeping a list of all the casting directors that I work with and directors and you know following up I was I just hate following up I always feel so really? cringe doing it well and I <laughs> I'm lucky enough I think in voiceover is that you know the people that follow up and connect are our agents mm -hmm. and um, for me a major shift in my career that's helped me to be more of an artist and and to let go of some of that business sense it, that I feel like that is kind of cringy too. you know like we're like oh, I don't I don't want to bother you yeah um <laughs> but coming to Abrams artists uh the team is incredible math there was a chemistry when we first met and we had an idea of what we would do and you know I've been here for eight months and like four network series and four triple a games later it's 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 doing okay right yeah the team's great we have a future we're we're they're constantly, you know, I think you should go meet with this production company. Nice. They've got several shows coming out. And, and so their We're being relationships. agents for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, obviously that's what an agent is. But uh, when you're first starting out, you, you're afraid, you're, right? You're well, like, oh, and you do everything hi. yourself. You're, yeah. you're figuring it out. And I think you, you can get lucky and get it on the first try. But True. for me, it's been several years in to find that perfect right. fit. Yeah that allows me to now expand into, you know, like we discussed, maybe doing more on camera and other opportunities. Um, to really grow and fit you as a person, yeah. you know? But I think that's the thing that a lot of actors are worried about with like agents is they see them as like the scary people that are like, oh, those are my agents. But it's like, you have to work w together. Yeah, It's a collaborative process. I'm so lucky. Yeah, I'm madly in love with, with my team and they're very personable and, you know, it, I can always approach them at the office and, um, and you know, even when I've had difficulties, I used to be like, I don't want to bother you with the bad stuff, you know? Yeah. And there was a, 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 you know, a situation where someone wasn't being appropriate and they, mm. they like stepped in, they're like, you shouldn't have to deal with this yeah. chop chop. And they took care of it. And it was like, Whoa, that's got like amazing. Yeah. Like, you're like, Oh my gosh, these people have my back. And, yeah. and I, I think in every relationship, whether it's a business relationship or personal, we have our best selves, but we don't want to be inconvenienced. Yeah. Like we don't want to be an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think part of the relationship is like, no, no, let me do that for you yeah. and vice versa. Like I want to do more for my agents and, and build different reels and, and explore things on my own. And I'm, I'm learning now to meet with other casting directors and create more opportunities Nice. Um, but they're doing just as much work. Well, and I'm sure your, rep your reputation is kind of adding to that too. You know, when you get a job and it's kind of like, hey, she shows up and she's amazing. Yeah. I'm sure they also That's what talk they to all each other say. and say, hey, <laughs> right? hire Mella, she's great. <laughs> um, I don't know, you know. No, it definitely, yeah. It took me about 10 years to be an overnight sensation. Yeah. But um, I think... It does take time. It takes time. And yeah. I think the consistency and... and and, you know, being someone that's fun to work with, which I think I am. Yay. I bake cookies a lot. And oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'm a baker. That's what my, kind of like, cookies? Um, well, my favorites to make are milk chocolate chip, dark chocolate cranberry, peanut butter. I'm working on a new lemon recipe. Ooh, that sounds yeah. good. Do you bring them in for like the holiday Christmas parties? At the I actually things? don't because they have plenty. I know, right? I was going to say, I, I, I bring in bring care in. packages. It's like the Lifeline care package. Yeah. I've done them for Respawn as well. Nice. I bring in care packages. In but like other times of the other year, probably. Times of the year. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I feel like during Christmas, I'm like, here's some vegetables. <laughs> right? And they're like, thank you. Uh, here's a gift certificate for some organic anything. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. <laughs> <A> personal trainer. <laughs> We're like doing the list of things that they can oh, use yeah. in January. Well, it's true though. You have to be very specific about what to get somebody. But anyway, it was so great having you here today. I wanted to kind of plug your social media. So if people wanted to follow you, I know you have a website. Is it just melalee.com? It is melalee.com. Best way to keep in touch with me though is the melalee, T H E M E L A L E E. So the melalee on Twitter and Instagram. And, um, or just call my agents at Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm Christy Kate Vo on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, you're welcome to follow me too if you want. And thanks for tuning in today, guys. Have a good one. <laughs>